Thank you all for joining with us here today. Since late July, the spread of COVID-19 has steadily and significantly declined. The number of new cases and new hospitalizations have been cut by more than two-thirds. Just yesterday, we had the lowest number of hospitalizations in the past three months. And importantly, the number of people recovering from COVID continues to skyrocket. Doctors have explained that the biggest reason for these improvements is because Texans are taking COVID seriously. People are following the CDC standards, social distancing, sanitizing their hands, and wearing masks when around others. Those safe practices remain the best defense against COVID until vaccines arrive in the coming months. These practices are particularly important now that students are returning to schools and colleges, now that fans are returning to sporting events, and now that flu season is upon us. Personal vigilance is the best way to keep down the number of COVID cases, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of fatalities. Now, while we go about protecting Texans from COVID, we, we must also be mindful of those who are suffering from the pandemic in other ways. People who are enduring family hardships and unprecedented financial challenges. But now with the medical advancements that we have made and the personal hygiene practices that we have adopted, Texans have shown that we can address both the health and safety concerns of COVID while also taking careful and measured steps to restore the livelihoods that Texans desperately need. Achieving both goals requires a framework that establishes safe standards that contain COVID, that emphasize protecting the most vulnerable, and that establish a clear metric that the public can depend upon. First, let me mention the safe standards. Until additional medical treatments are available, we must continue the safe practices that slowed the spread this summer. That includes staying at home if you're sick, sanitizing your hands, maintaining safe distances, and wearing a mask. Those personal behaviors will continue to slow the spread while opening schools and while adding jobs. Safety will also be enhanced with a massive increase in testing. Texas is scheduled to receive millions of these 15-minute tests per month that will help Texans know immediately if they have COVID. We can also reduce fatalities by remaining focused on protecting the most vulnerable. Most deaths are people over 70. Half of those are people over 80. We can save more lives by continuing to shield our seniors from exposure to COVID. Now to determine if we are progressing on the right path or if we need a course correction, we need a fair and reliable metric. From the very beginning of this pandemic, doctors have said that COVID must be slowed to ensure that our hospital capacity is not overrun like what was seen in Italy and places like New York as well as other places. Hospitalizations is the most important information about the severity of COVID in any particular region. It is also the most accurate information available on a daily basis. Remember that no doctor has ever suggested that the goal is to eradicate 100% of COVID cases. That is impossible even after vaccines become available. The goal has always been to contain the disease, to limit its harm, and to maximize the healthcare system's ability to treat both COVID patients as well as other medical needs of the community. So the way this works is this. When COVID hospitalizations are high, it means that the spread of COVID is excessive in a particular region and that corrective action is needed. When hospitalizations are low, it means that COVID is better contained in that region and that businesses can reopen. This metric is particularly effective because it distinguishes the severity of COVID between one region of Texas from others. The fact is that 
Not all parts of Texas are impacted the same by COVID. A high level of spread in one part of the state may be completely irrelevant to the COVID condition in another part of the state 500 miles away. An easy example shows why. Amarillo is closer to Kansas and Colorado than it is to Dallas and Houston. It would be more affected by the COVID condition in those states than in other regions in Texas. As a result, the severity of COVID in one region of Texas should not dictate the business practices in some far distant region of the state. So moving forward, we will continue to consider all of the relevant factors for additional business openings or for course correction as needed. But we will rely most heavily on hospitalizations of COVID patients in the 22 hospital regions in Texas. Doctors and hospitals suggest that it can be a warning if more than 15% of hospitalizations are of people with COVID. Hospitalizations above that level signal a serious spread and begins to compromise a hospital's ability to respond to COVID. More specifically, if the COVID hospitalizations are less than 15% of all hospitalizations for seven consecutive days, then the region is safe enough to allow additional openings. On the other hand, if COVID hospitalizations rise above 15% for seven consecutive days, then course correction is going to be needed. That correction would likely mean that it would require a reduction in the extent to which a region is able to open. To explain how this works, uh, we present this chart to you. This chart shows the 22 hospital regions in Texas. If you look on the left column, it shows the 22 hospital regions across the state. The middle column shows the peak percentage of hospitalizations of people with COVID in each region. You'll see that 20 of the 22 regions peaked above that 15% metric. In five regions, more than half of the people hospitalized were hospitalized with COVID. The right column shows the status today, and you can see how remarkably we've been able to contain the hospitalizations in so many regions across the state. But even with hospitalizations plummeting, three regions remain in the danger zone. One is the Rio Grande Valley, another is Laredo, and the third is Victoria. At this time, that level of COVID hospitalization shows that COVID is still spreading too much for those regions to be able to expand their openings. So we will continue to work with those regions to help them better contain their COVID spread, as well as to help them lower their hospitalization rates. The other 19 regions are able to open at the expanded capacity announced today. However, before going over the new standards, let me make two quick points. First, for months now, most businesses have been able to open at a 50% capacity. Actually, some with no capacity limits whatsoever. The extent to which Texas has been open is reflected in the plummeting unemployment rate. At the end of April, it had soared to almost 13%. By now, that number has been cut almost in half. During that time period, more than, more than half a million jobs were added. So substantial improvement for the Texas economy and for individual pocketbooks is already underway. The second point is that there are some Texans who want to fully open Texas 100% as if COVID no longer is a threat. The fact is COVID does still exist and most Texans remain susceptible. If we fully reopen Texas without limits, without safe practices, it could lead to an unsustainable increase in COVID that would require the possibility of being forced to ratchet back down. The better approach is to safely take strategic steps that help Texans return to jobs while also protecting them from COVID. And that is what we are announcing today. For the 19 hospital regions where COVID hospitalizations are less than 15% of all hospitalizations, 
the following business categories that currently have a 50% capacity can increase to a 75% capacity. That includes all retail stores, all restaurants, all office buildings, all manufacturing, all museums and libraries, and all gyms. Those openings can begin as early as Monday, September the 21st. Also, effective immediately, hospitals in those regions can return to ordinary elective surgical procedures. And additionally, all nursing home facilities, assisted living centers, state-supported living centers, and other long-term care facilities are allowed to reopen for visitation. They must, however, comply with certain health protocols, and there must be no COVID outbreak at those facilities. All of those facilities are now allowed to offer essential caregiver visits. To give these facilities the time they need to prepare for the additional visitations to begin, uh, they will be allowed to open up next week, September the 24th. Because bars are nationally recognized as COVID spreading locations, they are still not able to open at this time. However, it is important for them to know that we are focused on finding ways to get them open. We need to see COVID numbers continue to be contained, and we need to work with the bars on effective strategies that will ensure that when they do open, the possibility of spread of COVID is contained. Some bars and their associations have offered some very helpful ideas, and we will continue to work with them on that process. Let me end with this. Without vaccines available, containing COVID is a challenge, but Texans have already shown that they are up to that challenge. The reality is that COVID hasn't suddenly disappeared in Texas. It's still here, and it's still a threat. But we are now armed with the personal safety standards and some medical advancements that can ensure that we can continue to tame COVID until more treatments and vaccines become available. So as we go about the process of continuing to contain COVID, we will also continue to work to open up Texas. Now I'll hand it over to Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Thank you, Governor. I know this is welcome news to everyone watching and all of the business owners out there. And I want to thank the people of Texas for giving us this opportunity to be here today because the reason the hospitalizations are down is because Texans are respecting other Texans. I think we're really looking out for each other and doing the best we can for the virus, which is still contagious, is not spreading as it once was. Uh, so Texans, you're the reason that we're at this point today. Uh, the best point we have been in through this entire time, quite frankly, and to continue uh, to continue to open and continue to maintain the status. As the governor said, we seriously have to remind ourselves the virus is still out there and we still have to be smart about what we're doing and look out for our fellow Texans. I want to thank the nurses and the doctors, uh, the companies that have come up with this new testing. I mean, think about this. Back in early March, we were testing a couple of hundred a week, and, and it took three days or longer to get the test back, and now we're going to have uh, millions of uh, quick tests, which will make everyone feel more comfortable. I know I've been traveling a lot. Uh, I've been tested a lot, and when I'm with a group of people who have been tested, and uh, you know they have an armband on, you know they're, they're safe, it allows you to be as normal as can possibly be in these times. And so I think that's going to give people a much better sense of comfort uh, that they are in a secure environment. Um, the treatments that we now have are a big part of, this is the other factor besides the people of Texas working together, the doctors and the nurses, uh, and what they've learned over this time. It's really been remarkable. And I know this has been a long ordeal for all of us, and we still have a ways to go. And we don't know where that end is when the vaccine comes. But it's remarkable what our health care system has done in treating of patients uh, compared to where we were in March when there was a lot of unknown. So I really thank them. And as I always say, because I always make this pitch, Governor, if there's one group of people that I think are the superheroes in addition to our 
our doctors and our nurses and our police and our fire, all those people who have never taken a day off, are those, are those grocery folks mm -hmm. that have, have been working almost at 100%, quite mm -hmm. frankly, from day one. And they never blink. Uh, they put themselves at risk, and I thank all of you. If, you work, if, if you're a checker, if you're a stalker, I used to do that as a kid. It's hard work. Thank you because you kept uh, us going when almost everyone else was closed down. So thank you, Texas, for what you've done. Thank you, Governor. I think this is a great step. And let's just continue to work together so Texas can lead the nation in reopening uh, our state. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Speaker Biden. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. <clears throat> We're here today because Texans made the decision to care about each other. And not simply care about each other's health and well-being with the virus, but Texans' economic health and well-being. Uh, Governor Abbott has shown great leadership by doing things that are required in times like this, and that is making hard choices, but listening to the experts, listening to the medical experts, and making choices based on science and fact. And today we're able to open even more of Texas than was already open. But we have to remember, our kids are back in school. We're enjoying more of a normal life. And that is because we have shown respect for each other. We, we follow the guidelines. We wear face coverings in public. We wash our hands regularly. We worry about each other's well-being. And when we do that, we succeed. And today is a great day because we're taking another major step to more freedom and openness in Texas. We're experiencing the things that make us happy. And we have proven that we can experience all of that when we simply do minor things like everyone in this room is doing, wearing a face covering, washing hands, social distance when possible. If we continue to do those things, we will continue to see Texans be healthy, and we will continue to see Texas be prosperous economically. Thank you for your leadership, Governor. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Dr. Hellerstedt, the Commissioner of uh, DSHS. Am I correct? No. Thank you, Governor. I'm John Hellerstedt, and uh, I am a pediatrician, and I am the commissioner for the Texas Department of State Health Services. And as a public health physician, I have three priorities. Number one, prevention. Number two, prevention. <laughs> Number three, prevention. And that's extremely important to understand. The success that we have enjoyed so far is because we are taking the steps that are necessary to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. Uh, we should be very uh, we should learn a lot from this. The thing that our, the summer taught us was the risk, the danger, the devastation, the destruction, the loss of life that COVID-19 can cause. I, pers I lost a very close personal friend to COVID-19. So we know that the threat is real, but we also know that the things that we have undertaken in the last several months work. There's no better proof than that, and no one should ever have any doubt anymore as to whether or not these things are effective. They are effective. They work in, in, in the second most populous state in the country, and they work in a very effective way. And so the plan that the governor and other leaders have outlined today uh, is going to work when we continue to remember prevention, prevention, prevention. We have done it. We are capable of doing it. We are up to this task, and let's not forget that, and let's stay the course. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, now, Doctor Verwas, uh, the Vice uh, Executive Vice Chancellor for Public Health at the University of Texas System. Thank you, uh, thank you, Governor, and uh, I want to thank uh, all the leadership here in Texas uh, for it, it's an incredible job that y'all have done to guide us to this point. Um, when you first brought me on in March, it was to really assess the hospital capacity and our manpower capacity, and I've had the opportunity to uh, participate in a number of other things related to the pandemic response. Uh, uh, the te old testing regime and the things of that nature and stuff. Um, but really my primary role and responsibility as you outlined for me was to assess our healthcare capacity and the manpower that it would take to sustain ourselves through the pandemic. Uh, we prepared for that uh, through your leadership and direction. Uh, we experienced that uh, in July uh, and through your leadership and direction, we did very well through that. The healthcare system in Texas is incredibly robust, and uh, hats off to them for stepping up and finding places to take care of patients within their facilities, finding manpower uh, across the entire country to come in and care for patients uh, in, in some of their worst times. And now we're seeing this on the downside. 
And I'm reminded that when we came together on this, it was to, one, let's protect everybody as much as we can. Let's limit the number of fatalities and death. Let's cocoon those people that are at high risk. And let's protect the integrity of the healthcare system. And Governor, your leadership has allowed us to really, you know, recognize the depth and breadth of our healthcare system. And uh, I'm very, very pleased and very proud of, to be part of this team. And I'm very pleased and very confident in the metrics that you've set forth to help guide us uh, through the balance of this until we get a vaccine, better therapeutic agents, and so forth. So thank you for that. And my, my hat's off to all the healthcare uh, providers out there, doctors, nurses, and the many others that make those uh, facilities work. Uh, I see the hero signs everywhere I go, and truly, uh, you all are heroes. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next, uh, Cecily Young, uh, the Commissioner for the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. Thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Speaker, for this opportunity and for the amazing um, leadership that you've provided during this pandemic. Governor, the announcement for opening up visitation, expanding visitation more, is wonderful news for our uh, for our families and the residents of these facilities. We know that we have um, had to safely protect these residents because of the, the damage of COVID-19, but there, there is very real loneliness and isolation that happens. And so by opening up, I think the families will be so pleased and the residents will be so comforted. So thank you for this excellent announcement and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Well, thank you for your help getting that done. Thank you. Uh, and now the Chief of the Texas Division of Emergency Management and MCIT. Thank you, Governor. And, and for all of the first responders and healthcare workers that are out there, thank you. Especially the, the almost 8,000 contract doctors and nurses that came in, put their families and everything else on side to help support us in our time of need. <coughs> our PPE caches are very deep. We've got millions of masks, hundreds of millions literally still available to go out. Our testing is getting more and more prevalent. There's over 1,800 places in Texas today to go get a COVID-19 test. Turnaround times are getting faster and better and better. And, and the final news is we're still in the throes of hurricane season. So while we're talking about COVID-19 today, please take a moment to make sure your family has a plan. And then again, we're supporting with sponsors all over this nation. We have over 250 firefighters out in California. Our urban search and rescue team is returning from Louisiana today. Just hats off to the men and women that keep doing a great job to keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. We'll take a few questions. Hey, Governor, um, you were at the White House uh, in April, right before the big fight here in Texas, and around the same time, President was telling Bob Woodward it was a lot worse than he was telling everyone else. Do you feel the least bit betrayed by that? And do you feel the, the least bit, even a little bit complicit in spreading that message that they were secret in, in the next eight words? I've had the opportunity to visit with the President dozens of times about the COVID-19 virus, and every time I've talked to him about it, he's been very serious about it. Uh, he's been urging Texas to take uh, the type of action that is needed to curtail the spread of the virus, and when I was with him in Orange, Texas just a couple of weeks ago, he applauded me uh, for the actions that Texas did take. Hey, Governor, you um, say that the lead line could have really been the COVID-19 saving the city of Texas and the community, and every day the Oval Office has only a 13 So the number of infections uh, have been slashed by two thirds uh, since July. The number of hospitalizations, which is the most important metric that shows the severity of the spread in any particular region, uh, has been slashed uh, by two thirds since July. Uh, yesterday, we had the lowest number of hospitalizations in the state of Texas. Uh, and so uh, all the metrics continue uh, to show that Texas is moving in the right direction. So but we, but So I don't know what's going on in other states. What I do know is this very easy and clear math. If, if you look at the number of active cases in the state of Texas, the number of active cases of COVID in the state of Texas has been cut more than half since July. If you look at the total uh, number of, of hospitalizations, they've been slashed by two thirds since July. 
Uh, and so, again, the numbers on a downtrend, everybody in Texas can easily pull out a chart in whatever region they are in, and they will see that Texas has been on a steady d downtrend since July. And I must emphasize this. The reason why every doctor has said that Texas is on a downtrend is because Texans uh, are taking COVID seriously and they are adopting the best practices of distancing themselves from others, sanitizing their hands, and wearing a mask when possible. The short answer to your questions is yes. Uh, so the uh, Federal Health and Human Services uh, and CMS uh, have required uh, certain testing standards in nursing homes uh, that must be implemented by the end of this month. And we are being provided the testing capability to do that. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, we're using uh, state-based protocols that mimic the federal protocols for the other type of uh, living facilities because we do want to continue uh, to safeguard uh, the health and safety of the, of the residents in those facilities. Final question. Governor, um, in regards to the bars, uh, last month the state listened to make, make, not listened, make modifications to bars in four of those cities to a district expansion order that you're doing. Does this apply to those type of facilities, or do you want them to hold at where they're at right now? Well, so what those bars have done, they have recategorized as restaurants. Every, every restaurant uh, that is operating as a restaurant uh, can expand to 75% uh, in all but those three regions. Remember this, however, Rudy, and that is that, that restaurants have certain protocols that require their patrons to be seated. Remember that if restaurants are not following those protocols, those restaurants can lose their license. And so when patrons come into a restaurant, they're required to be wearing a mask until they are seated. They're required to stay seated unless they need to go to the restroom or unless they're leaving. And if they're walking around anywhere in the restaurant, they're supposed to have a mask on. If restaurants are not following those standards, those restaurants stand to lose their license. Last question, Paul. Last question, Paul. Last question. With, with regard to mail-in uh, voting, uh, that is a process that the legislature has evaluated every single year, and you have everyone uh, in the House, everyone in the Senate, and the leadership on both sides uh, weigh in and determine uh, what those voting standards should be. And those voting standards have, have, are thoughtfully uh, arrived at uh, and have proven to be effective. As you know, what I did do uh, to ensure the safety of people during the election process is to ensure there would be an additional week for people to be able to vote early so that they would not be required to go into crowded settings when they go about the process of voting early. Thanks, guys. We gotta go. Thank you. Appreciate it.